PETG stringing and how to deal with it, watertight prints that aren't actually watertight, and some first layer issues dealing with Super Slicer. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 87. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, and if you're new here and you're dealing with some print fails, we are here to help you, but hey, if you don't mind, leave a like and get subscribed. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps out the channel immensely. We're gonna be talking about some awesome print failures today. And hey, if you are looking to submit your print fails to have myself or anyone on the team take a look at, you can do so by hitting us up on all the social media, sliding into those DMs or emailing us directly, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com and we'll do what we can to help you out. It's what we do here and we really like doing it. What we also like doing is telling you about our sponsor, 3D Musketeers. That's right, we're sponsoring Print Fix Friday this week and it is a little bit of a different one. While we do want to help you make awesome every single day, and we're happy to take over your 3D printing if you would like it, I actually need your help. We've got a lot of projects going on right now, and one of them is how we can expand the business of 3D Musketeers. We were looking to do a shipping container, but unfortunately, laws here in Pasco County, Florida mean we don't have five acres of land, so we might not be able to do that. So if you understand building codes, county codes, and know how to read laws better than I can, and uh, would love to help out, I could really use some help on this because I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. And the last thing I want to do is piss off somebody from county government. So could really use some help. If you know what you're doing, please email me directly and use the title shipping container business because I think it would be a really cool build to show you guys how we can take a shipping container and turn it into a completely portable and transportable 3D printing facility that we can use to deploy during really bad weather events like when we have hurricanes here in Florida or if we decide to move put the whole damn thing on the back of a truck and move it be a lot of fun but I need some help to make this happen. And we are moving forward with getting back into some of the products that we had previously been working on, like the Making Awesome Academy and the Politician. And the Politician will be at the East Coast Rep Rap Festival. So if you want to get your hands on one, come and find me at the East Coast Rep Rap Festival in September and October this year. We'll have a few with us because we're going to be... Uh, helping out some people that are there. But yeah, there's a lot coming down the tube. So if you are interested in that, leave a like, get subscribed. If you do want to donate to the efforts that we're doing here, Patreon, YouTube channel members, and now a PayPal option as well, linked below to help support what we do here because that shipping container is not going to be cheap. We're looking at like a twenty dollars to $25,000 build out, and that pretty much is my budget to expand the business. And I really don't want to put a building down if I'm planning on moving at some point. Anyways, let's talk for another day, but I do appreciate you guys listening to this. So let's get into actually fixing some fails that aren't government related. Let's get to it. Thick strings inside of hollow tubes with PETG. We can see here that it appears to be a Soval SV06. We've got some other concerns here, but let's take a look at some other photos. Definitely have some retraction issues. And yeah, this is typical PETG, but let's read through what we got. It's Prusa Slicer, SV06, stock 0.4 millimeter nozzle, 0.03 millimeter Z height offset in slicer, which isn't going to do anything for this. 230 on the nozzle, 80C on the first layer, 75C on the next ones. Again, totally fine. 5015 at 60%, disable the first four layers, no problem. 10 second minimum layer time with 10 millimeter per second minimum speed, again, no issues. Retraction at 0.5 millimeters, 40 millimeters per second, and no wiping. There you go. So with PETG, it is a more viscous and sticky plastic than you would get with a PLA. So it has a tendency to string. It could be that the filament is getting a little bit damp, so you could toss it into a dry box and see how that goes. But for this particular one, I would really just look at increasing your retraction. Normally speaking, with PETG, you want at least an extra half a millimeter of retraction above what you would do for PLA. That's because, again, it's sticky and you need to pull it out of the nozzle further. 40 millimeters a second is fine, and you definitely want to look at wiping with PETG. We run about 25% wipe, and we do it during the retract inside of Prusa Slicer, and it seems to run well. 
but with little strings like that, a butane torch in two seconds and they're they're gone. You can go and chase down PETG, but as it starts to absorb moisture, it will start doing this again. And you're gonna keep increasing your attraction, increasing your attraction, increasing your attraction. And then you start a new spool and it starts to clog because it's retracting too much. So you have to play this game of keeping everything kind of within a decent level, but also understanding that PETG is a little susceptible to moisture. It's not gonna start popping and hissing like what we expect from really waterlogged materials. You'll actually get materials that will start to sound like Rice Krispies. PETG just starts to string a little bit, then it starts to get really bad. And the stringing is that kind of first indication that there is some dampness in the filament. I appreciate all of this information because it really does help. And we can see that there is a previous post over on r slash Sovol where uh, things were pretty bad. So we have someone here saying that they are using lower retraction and it ran just fine. Remember, what works for one person might not always work for somebody else. So don't always believe that if it worked for them, it's gonna work for you. And we can see that, yeah, three millimeter retraction, they've tried two millimeter, probably should revert to that. Yeah, three millimeters actually high. And I believe that Sobel tells you to keep it under one millimeter of retraction to remove any issues with potential jamming, but I don't really have any issues. Inside of Proof Slicer, we normally run about one and a quarter millimeters for PETG, and we pull it out very fast, like 65 or 70 millimeters a second. But then the D retract is the 20 to 30 millimeters per second. That way we can try to get the stringing away and keep it at a minimum. But keeping a small propane torch handy is good. And these ones are relatively affordable and they use the really cheap cans of propane. It's a $4 can of propane with, I think it's a $40 head on it because it's the uh, auto igniter. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's the auto igniter. So I don't have to, you know, use a lighter or something like that. These are incredibly handy. You can also use a kitchen butane torch, but I end up losing those. So I like those better personally. And uh, uh, I, it's been like three years on the same can of propane. So it's, but all the other settings seem to be good. 230 on the nozzle might be a little cold, but if you are getting good quality prints that have some strength, you'll be fine. I would start with messing with your retraction a little bit, but if you're not seeing any reduction in the stringing, let's get that filament in a dryer and see what it looks like. Again, PETG is more susceptible to waterlogging, but this is certainly nowhere near as bad as we've even had PETG get waterlogged. So I think they're on the right path. This is the right move. And while they did go ahead and dry it for four hours at 60C and an air fryer, I mean, I guess four hours is nowhere near enough time. I mean, we're talking 12 hours minimum preferably 24. Filament takes a long time to dry because you have to heat the entire thing evenly. And while four hours might get that entire thing heated up, your air fryer is also not gonna have a very good temperature control. We personally like to recommend food dehydrators like ones you would use for making beef jerky. And you can often find those at thrift stores for relatively cheap. Although, Honestly, a good filament dryer is not very expensive. They come in oftentimes under 50 bucks and to not have to modify a food dehydrator is kind of worth it. We keep a few actually above the main set of Prusa's. We have one for lower temp that goes up to 55 C and then we have one that goes up to 70 C as well. And I just have a Bowden tube that's long enough to reach any of those four machines. In fact, you can see it. There's the Bowden tube running to the Prusa with a diamond nozzle on it because we are testing more carbon fiber filaments. I would work on your retractions. You're on the right path for the drying. You're on the right path for kind of everything that's going on here. So keep up that work. I know this can be frustrating, but you'll get there. Promise. Water leaking ABS filament Ender 3 Pro with enclosure. I printed the self watering plant here in ABS. Nozzle temp was 240, bed temp was 110. Default speed settings with 100% infill. I was expecting a watertight reservoir, but although there are no visible layer separations or any issues, it is not watertight. Any idea how to fix it? Yeah, there's a saying nothing is watertight. If you really do want to get a watertight 3D print, it's epoxy or a really fat nozzle and quite a few perimeters. What you are likely dealing with is your Z seam is aligning. All your attractions are aligning and it only takes a couple little areas where air can get through 
that water too can get through. Coat it with a little bit of epoxy and you'll be good. In fact, even a clear coat, like a clear coat spray paint would likely be enough to seal this. Just understand that there is water inside of the print right now and it would be best to leave it outside or put it in some sort of system that's a little warm to let all that water evaporate. Because if you do trap it inside of the part, it will keep the epoxy or paint, whatever you choose to use from drying appropriately. So be careful about that. Now, I do know people that have made drinking cups out of filament and all of that before. Those are often spiral vase mode where it is one continuous strand of plastic so that there really isn't a place where you could have these issues. Even in parts where we've done tons of perimeters and all that, water still finds a way. With all the weight of water, it doesn't take much for it to start to seep through the micro cracks that you get in between layers. And coincidentally, this is also why 3D printing is not food safe. And I don't care if the raw material is food safe. 3D printing with FDM is not food safe, period. If you are using a plastic, a thermoplastic, it is not safe for food contact because there is no way to properly sanitize it. Now, if you're doing it for some sort of test and you want to see if it can hold water, fine, don't drink the water. But please don't use 3D printed stuff to eat out of. If you do it once and throw it away as a novelty, fine. It's not going to kill you. But if you attempt to clean it, and I'm looking at you, people that make cookie cutters with 3D printers, you need to put some sort of saran wrap or some sort of barrier in between the plastic and the food item. Even though cookie dough does get cooked and can bake off a lot of that crap, you don't want to take those risks, especially if you're giving those out as gifts. Something to remember when you're making custom stuff for people. There is some level of responsibility that we have as makers to make certain that the parts that we are producing are safe for not only ourselves, but those that we give them to, whether it be a client, family member, or a friend. First layer issue, holes at the end of extrusion. Is this really bad tuned PA? pressure advance, or perhaps a flow issue. We take a look at the photos. We definitely have some issues with it not really coming to a close. So let's see what we got going on here. Hi, I'm starting to notice issues my first layer of my prints. It looks like the extrusion stops before the end of the move is how I can best describe it. And you can see little holes where it happens. This is on a heavily modded Ender 3 Pro with an E3 DV6 using Clipper and Super Slicer. I'll attach some relevant settings in a screenshot, but my gut says it might be a pressure advance issue or perhaps a flow or first layer issue. The print is 0 0.02 millimeter layer heights, eSun PETG at 230 with a 0.4 nozzle and a 70 seat bed. Any advice? Welcome. Thank you in advance. So here's the thing with Super Slicer. While it is pretty much Prusa Slicer for control freaks, it runs at least one revision behind Prusa Slicer. We'll card to my first look and our entire playlist actually of Super Slicer. It's cool, but it does have a lot of options that you probably won't ever use. And to me, that kind of doesn't seem worth it. And the current latest update of Super Slicer does not have Arachne. Arachne is developed by Ultimaker Cura, which enables this dynamic adjustment of your line width during a print. So where we see these white bits here, which is a secondary extrusion, Arachne would enable you just to continue this line as it is adjusting that flow as the part occurs. And that's what leaves the gaps that we see here. The other thing is this is likely somewhat due to a pressure advance issue. If you are running this heavily modded machine, this is really what pressure advance looks like. And honestly, this corner here is really what clues me into it being pressure advance because we're not really hitting our start and stop point. So the machine is stopping flow or retracting before it gets to the end of the line. What pressure advance basically does is it knows that your machine is going to over extrude at the end of a line. There will be some oozing and you can tune it so that it stops flow right before, or in some cases actually retracts the filament before it finishes the line. This enables for relatively sharp corners. It's effectively arachne, but on the hardcore like end of controlling stepper motors. And while Prusa Slicer does have a lot of this stuff enabled and has some really cool ways to ramp up speeds to handle this, I do believe this is going to be a combination of not just your pressure advanced settings, but also Arachne. If you are not using a lot of the big advanced features inside of Super Slicer, it's really not going to benefit you all that much. And while we will be taking a look at Orca Slicer coming soon here on the channel, I 
do kind of question why you would choose to go with Super Slicer over something like Prusa Slicer that is more constantly updated, especially now with the 2.6 alphas that include organic supports, or as a lot of you are used to them being the organic free range tree supports. But yeah, in this particular case, this is going to be your uh, arachne issue versus the traditional method. This is going to be more pressure advanced, and this to me is also going to be more pressure advanced. But let me know what you guys think in those comments. I don't have a lot of experience with Clipper, as we've talked about here on the channel before. And in fact, we have a Voron Trident on the way. So all you that have been yelling at me to build a Voron, your prayers and screams and whatever it is we're going to call them are being answered right now by LDO Motors. So thank you, LDO, for making all that happen. Stay tuned because I think you guys are going to really like it. And if you have any ideas for some color combinations, let me know because I did not get a blue frame as a lot of you might have expected. It is a red frame trident. So let me know some colors because uh, it looks like Polymaker wants to go ahead and sponsor the filament for that project as well. We're kind of looking forward to doing that one. Uh, lots of ABS parts, ASA parts. I love me getting into some of that, especially because it will allow me to really let the bamboo start stretching its legs because they certainly do a lot better with the styrene based plastics than they do with something like a PLA or a PETG. Problem with the Saturn too. You don't say this is a, this is a problem. It's a, it's a real problem. Let's see if we got something from the original poster here regarding what's going on. Hello, I purchased Saturn 2 almost three months ago. The printer was working fine at the start. However, after almost 10 prints, I noticed some leaks under the tank. I bought new PFA sheets and replaced the old ones, but I had even more leaks under the tank. The tape around the screen started to peel off because of these leaks. I fixed the leak issue after the third PFA sheet replacement, but now the printer is not printing properly. I re-leveled the printer multiple times, but the issue still exists. The prints are coming out out as blocks with the initial layer that I didn't slice. I have to try cleaning the screen in the tank, but the issue still persists. Can you please advise on what to do next? This particular case here is overfilling. We are really close to our max line, and I believe the resin has just leaked out. When this does occur, we can have some pretty serious issues with resin getting into places that it shouldn't belong because again, resin is toxic. You guys know this. And while it technically isn't toxic, it's toxic. Just believe it's toxic and, and we'll be cool. We definitely have some printing issues and a first layer that doesn't look great. I am worried that the resin has gotten into places that it simply doesn't belong and is starting to wreak havoc on the electronics. It would be good to get the tank off of this machine look at really watching some videos on how to replace FEP and PFA. We did a video covering it. It's certainly not the most comprehensive and likely would do with a refresh, but it works really well. And that tank that we did in that video is actually still going plenty strong to this day. But I do believe you've got some issues with resin where it doesn't belong. So I would get the tank off the printer, clean everything out, go ahead and dump and filter your resin back into a resin bottle. And let's go ahead and start disassembling the printer. If you open the printer and see resin inside of the printer, oh, I wish you the best of luck. You can soak electronics and everything like that inside of isopropyl alcohol, and it shouldn't have any major effect with it, but you will need to clean off everything really heavily. And at some point, it doesn't pay, and you might as well just buy a brand new printer. And while I recognize these printers are not cheap, it's a lot of labor. And if you are willing to go through the labor, by all means, go ahead, but it's not great. The screen definitely has some issues. We can certainly see some resin that's gotten under there, and that is going to really affect some things. And looking at our actual print settings, we can see that everything seems to be, you know, reasonably above board. I'm not too worried about anything that we see here. Everything looks pretty normal to me, but I will tell you, that's not normal. That's not normal. And a lot of these things here aren't normal. We can see that the printer is printing quite a bit and it's right at the max line. Look, here's the deal. You don't have to fill your printers to the max line. And in fact, I recommend that you don't. The closer you get to the max line, the closer that your entire printer being off level or off tram on a surface matters a whole lot more. If your printer is tilted forward for some reason and you're measuring for the max fill line on the back and you put your build plate into that printer, it's going to slosh resin over and create this forbidden smoothie. I'm not. There are some bad jokes I can make here, but I'm going to opt not to do it just to save some face here. But realistically, there are some things that need to be done. And 
I would start by first really going and cleaning off this machine, making sure your resin doesn't have a lot of gunk or dirt or anything like that in it, because I would bet there's quite a bit of solidified resin floating around in that resin tank. So once we get to that, then let's look at some slicer settings. It does not appear that you're exposing properly given whatever ambient temperatures that you're in, and you might benefit from a politician. And yes, I am back working on the politician. We had stopped for a little bit. I am back on it now as we are reevaluating the future of 3D Musketeers. Stay tuned for future podcasts. Cause we're going to be talking all about that, but you should be coming to this weekend's podcast, Mother's Day Sunday, because my mom is going to be our guest. She's never been on the channel before. It should be fun. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, Ask my mom, you can reach out to us on all the social medias. Tweet at me is probably the best way, or just slide into those DMs if you'd like, specifically on Twitter. That's normally the best place to reach me directly. Or email them, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com. That always works. Definitely want to get this thing taken care of first, get it printing reliably, because I would look at also checking your slicers, but honestly, let's take care of some of the big issues that we have before we start diving into any slicer issues. Warping is getting out of hand. Help. As shown in the image and title, I'm having serious warping issues. I'm using a CR10 with a direct drive upgrade on a glass bed. I'm printing with black PLA using 0.08 millimeter nozzle. I varied my settings a little, but average is about 210 and 60. Printing slow first layer about 30 millimeters a second, and no warping can be seen about halfway through the infill. As suggested by many websites, I've tried using tape on the brim. It's clearly not working. I don't have an enclosure, but I don't have windows open either. Any help would be greatly appreciated. This issue is going to be about heat. 210C with a 30 millimeter a second first layer with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle might not be hot enough. You're putting down some thick layers. In fact, we talked all about different nozzle sizes just on Wednesday. We'll cart that video so you can take a look. I have a feeling that you might be running a little too cold, but we've got a commenter pointing out something that I didn't really pick up on but might be something valuable to look at. Is that electrical box on the left side blowing air at the print bed? I had parts curling up because my PC fan was blowing at it. Simply putting a price of card in between fixed a large amount of the problem. Assuming you mean like a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard. Do you know that might be it? I, I was really going toward this is a heat issue, but we can see the right side looks okay. We got a little bit of warping over there, but I looked at this and said, well, we're not connecting our infill. So I'd like to see some higher temperatures. Remember you're extruding a ton of plastic with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle running likely close to one millimeter in your line width. And to do that, you do need to make sure that you have adequate heat. When we run nozzles that big, we like to kick our temps up at least 10 to 15 seconds above normal because you got to make sure you get the center core of that filament hot as well. If you don't, you might end up with warping during the cool down process of that material. And yeah, that uh, grate there could be blowing air across and that is certainly not going to help the problem that we have here. So grain of salt, my advice, definitely take a look at the fan itself, but I would look at raising those temps a little bit, especially with a nozzle that big. The other thing to check for is to make sure that your glass is actually clean, but I really don't think it's going to be that. I believe that when you start printing layers like this, even PLA will start to warp if it's not cooled adequately. And this is not just being cooled inadequately, it is being cooled constantly where it shouldn't be cooled, assuming you do have some sort of a cross breeze. Otherwise, increase those temps and see if that helps. But let me know what you guys think of episode 87 of Print Fix Friday. We're getting close to that 100 mark, and that means we have to decide what we're doing with the future of this series. So let me know what you guys think we should be doing in those comments below because I feel like we're starting to cover the same stuff over and over again. Seems like a lot of the failures seem to be pretty consistent and it seems to be pretty brand consistent as well. We're noticing some trends. I wonder if you guys have noticed them as well. I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments below. And if you thought I got any of these wrong, maybe some extra advice we could be giving to these people. That's all I have for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. And a massive thank you goes out to all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube channel member supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Remember, if you do want to join these elite group of musketeers, you can do so by clicking those links in that description down below. Right below me will be the entire Print Fix Friday series where you can see all about print fails and how to fix them. And right next to that will be our Rocky Mountain Rep Rap Festival coverage where you can go take a look at some really awesome products by some really awesome makers. I will see you all down in those comments and in the next one. Take care.